Well, welcome to the Sermon on the Mount series. Excited for you to be joining me. I'm Pastor C.J. Neuendorp, uh, pastor of young adults at Emmanuel Reformed Church here. And uh, just really excited to be diving into this longest and really most famous sermon that Jesus gives us in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It's the longest continuous message by Jesus in all of the Gospels and all of the books written about Jesus. And we're going to learn together about what he teaches us in this section. Now you've got to give me grace because as a pastor, I'm going to be learning right along with you as we walk through these few chapters and see what Jesus calls us to and how he calls us to live. So my goal over the next 12 weeks is to give you and your groups, you know, 8 to 10 minutes worth of questions and thoughts to chew on as we work our way through this sermon. Now before we get into any of it, we have to get the setting of the Sermon on the Mount. In the first two verses of the, of the sermon, so to speak, or, or of chapter 5, it says that Jesus goes up on a mountainside and the crowds gather around him. Now, going up on a mountainside and the crowds following, what might that have looked like? Well, for me, someone who lives in Los Angeles, I picture the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, where you would have to make a hike to get up to the plateau at the top. These people, they wanted to follow Jesus. They wanted to learn from Jesus. They wanted to hike up in order to uh, learn from him. They had a desire to follow him. And second, who would have been in the crowd? Who would have been in this group of people? Well, most likely it would have been a bunch of cast-offs and nobodies, people that were excited to learn about this new way of Jesus because the other ways had kind of tossed them out. And so as we go forward, we're going to see that Jesus, he approaches all these people. And what he's going to do is Jesus is going to teach us how to live. It's a sort of how-to guide, you might say, for living in the kingdom of heaven. Sort of an, an idiot's guide to Jesus' way, if you will. So that's the very first fill in the blank there as you're working your way through in your booklets that the Sermon on the Mount is all about living like Jesus. It's how to live like Jesus. It's a living like Jesus text. You know, Jesus, he has a particular lifestyle that he's going to call people that want to be his disciples to. It's not just for him about knowing everything, even though he's teaching them, but it's also about living and acting as a Jesus follower. And the Sermon on the Mount for these few chapters, he's going to teach us how to do that. So as Jesus teaches us how, we get to the first really 12 verses or verses 3 through 12. And today that's what we're really focusing and zeroing in on in this first uh, section, week 1. And it's entitled Upside Down Blessings. And with this group of blessings, Jesus is going to lay the foundation for the rest of his sermon. Jesus, in telling us who is considered blessed in the kingdom of heaven, is going to lay the foundation for the rest of what's to come in his teaching. Now, commonly, verses 3 through 12 of the Sermon on the Mount are called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes, which simply means blessed. So the first uh, nine verses of really Jesus' teaching are called the Beatitudes, which means blessed blessed. Now what we're going to see is that blessing doesn't necessarily look like the way the world calls blessing or even the way I might see myself as being blessed or wanting to be blessed. We're going to see how Jesus defines what it is to be blessed and that might be very different. And why might it be different? Well here's the header really over all these beatitudes that I want you to get. The kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, is upside down. The kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, is upside down. Jesus is going to flip the script on us, so to speak, kind of turn things on their head as we work our way through these first few verses. Now, Jesus lifts off a number of blessings, and let's listen to them together and fill them in as we go through just these Beatitudes. First, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus continues and says, Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who who mourn. In verse 5 it says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's his next one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Jesus says in verse 8, blessed 
are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And finally, Jesus closes and says, Blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Now, as I listen through that list and really read off that list, I think to myself, a lot of those things don't sound like blessings to me. In my spirit or in my flesh, you might say, a lot of those things don't sound like something I would consider blessed. But Jesus, he's flipping the script on its head. He's challenging us to think in upside down ways about the way the world works and about the way blessing works in his kingdom. Because that's his kingdom. You know, Jesus, he came from heaven to earth and then he died on a cross. And that whole story is quite upside down. So it shouldn't come as too big a surprise to us that his kingdom is upside down. So now let's zero in together on just a few of these Beatitudes. We don't have time for them all, so let's zero in on just a few of them. So first, it says, to be blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, what exactly does it mean to be poor in spirit? It kind of can feel like a cryptic thing that Jesus has told us. Here's what I would venture to say. I would say that to be poor in spirit means you rely on God wholeheartedly. To be poor in spirit means you rely on God wholeheartedly. You know, it's in a sense, when we're poor in spirit, we don't think too highly of ourselves. We don't too think highly of ourselves because we think highly of God and our need for God and our reliance on God. We lay our lives down and we kind of lean on God the way Jesus did throughout his life. I think to be poor in spirit means that we repent often. We realize we're broken. We confess, we repent, and we see that we have a deep need for God. When we're poor in spirit, we say, I have a deep need for God. And that's the base level in the kingdom of God is that you got to say, I have a need for God. So to be poor in spirit means you rely on God wholeheartedly. Now jump down two verses to verse 5, and Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Now meekness, that's kind of not really a super common word uh, in today's language. I don't think or say it or call a lot of people meek. But one of the words we use a lot that maybe is similar to meek would be humble. And so to be meek, I think in a lot of ways, looks like humility. So here's my claim, though, to what humility, what meekness means. To be meek means to lower ourselves and elevate others. To lower ourselves and elevate others. And Jesus, he's totally flipping us around here, right? Because naturally, I want to think way more about myself than I do about others. But Jesus says, you got to lower your view, lower the importance of yourself and elevate the importance of others. Now, just because we're elevating the importance of others doesn't think that we look down on ourselves. I love a C.S. Lewis quote about humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. So humility, meekness, it's not to just think less of yourself that you're not a great person, but it's just thinking of yourself less, thinking more about others, seeking the well-being of others. So when we're meek, we're blessed because we're elevating others. We're looking to serve others the way Jesus did. Then you jump down two more verses. To blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The merciful, those who extend mercy, are shown mercy, which leads to my claim here, that we must be forgiven by God so that we can forgive others. We must be forgiven by God so that we can forgive others. When we realize the amazing mercy God has shown to us because we're all broken. We all have things that we have that we wish we didn't. And the good news is is that Jesus forgives us out of that. And then once we've been forgiven by God, we need to extend forgiveness to other people. Forgiven people forgive other people. And so in a sense, what Jesus says here is when you are willing to extend the mercy that I've extended to you, then my mercy truly will be at work in your lives. If you only receive God's mercy and don't extend it, 
then you're not going to be shown mercy, Jesus says here. You have to be merciful. We're meant to be people that bring healing, that bring mercy, that bring forgiveness. Okay, two more verses down. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers. What does that sound like to me? It sounds to me like peace is an active endeavor. Peace is an active endeavor. Peace is not just sitting back and hoping things don't go wrong or thinking things will figure themselves out. The world will naturally get better if we just kind of stay away from each other. No, we're called to be peacemakers. We're called to step in and bring peace, bring reconciliation into the world. Clark talked a a few weeks ago in one of our sermons about the Hebrew word for shalom and that when you break the Hebrew word shalom down, it means that we destroy the power connected to chaos or evil. So bringing shalom, bringing peace is actually destroying the power of chaos and evil. It's an active endeavor. We are called to go out and make peace, bring peace. That's something that's really needed in today's day and age, but we have to be willing to go out and to bring it. So as we close, looking at the Beatitudes, we're all talking about blessing, and we realize this final point. Blessing is all about living God's way. In today's world, I think a lot of times I think people think that blessing means that I'm getting material things, that I'm blessed when I have a lot of stuff or the stuff I want. Or maybe blessing is when I'm feeling good and things are going well in my life and everything's just kind of on the the smooth. But that's not blessing. Jesus lays out blessing and he says blessing is about living God's way and being God's person. So we realize blessing means that we have to look more like Jesus, look more like God. Blessing is living God's way. So I hope you enjoyed this first week as we looked at the upside down blessings Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with and hope you have a great time discussing that in your groups.